I faced them, my knees shaken, my mouth dry. The words I had memorized went out of my head and I was afraid. I wanted to deliver my speech more than anything else in the world because I felt it would help me to gain respect, to become visible. But my throat tightened and my tongue fell as if it were glued to the roof of my mouth. So this is a quote from An Invisible Man by Ralph Ellison, but it's roughly how I felt in 2017 in Warsaw when I gave my lightning talk. Um, since then, I gave a few more talks. Um, I must say, I don't feel as uh, stressed anymore, but I still have some of those symptoms. And while talking to PostgreSQL community, and I've been around for some time, um, around those people, I heard from many people that they feel the same way when they're trying to make connections during conferences like this one, when you have an overwhelming number of people. So this talk is about that. So a few words about me. I have a bit of a mixed uh, kind of background. I work with a lot of with uh, researchers in academia at the beginning of my career, and then I moved on to working also with researchers, but within pharma industry, and um, now I'm obviously I'm in IT and the databases. In PostgreSQL community, um, so I'm an organizer of this, one of the organizers of this conference. I'm also PGS user group committee chair, and I'm on the funds group. And I just, in general, try to get involved in different initiatives and, and things. Uh, for example, now we have a diversity committee, um, of which I'm part of as well. So in all those places, I was really focusing on communications, and uh, that's what I do for a living. Um, and in my view, communications is really about building connections and trying to understand um, people and what they want, trying to explain to them what you do and to build those connections. I work in a company called Data Ingrid. You might have heard about it uh, before. So we work with Postgres, we have a team of DBAs and we uh, do anything from migrations to audits, provide architectural uh, advice, um, basically helping our clients who have PostgreSQL databases to make the most out of Postgres. We also run developer trainings and we're quite deeply involved in the community. So going back to the topic that I started to talk about, the connections and building connections, there is a lot of uh, research that has, done, has been done um, around communication and connection between different people. Um, and there's a lot of research that says that meaningful and strong connections in our lives, not only networking for work, but in general, uh, really helps us to live happy and healthy lives. And some, uh, some people talking about, like Brenner Brown talking about uh, authentic connections and, and others speaking about how to build those connections. But um, there is overwhelming number of uh, amount of data that says that strong connections really help us to thrive uh, in our lives. So there was this very interesting study that has been done um, for over 80 years now and is still ongoing um, that I wanted to share with you. And it's the study of human happiness. Um, what they've done, they had two cohorts of people, one group from Harvard and another group from Boston suburbs. Um, and initially there were groups of men, but now the study also involves around over 50% of women. Um, and what they've done with those people, they basically conducted interviews throughout their lifetime, asking them questions about um, their hobbies, what they do, what they do for life, for work, how their relationship is, how many connections they have, how many relatives they have, what sort of connections with those, with those people they have and how frequently they interact with them and so on and so forth. And what they're trying to understand with that study is um, how beneficial those connections are for people and how happy they make them feel. And what the study showed is that good relationships really keeps us healthy and happy. And what's important is not the quantity, but the quality of those connections. So you not necessarily need 
thousand people to be connected to, but even if you have two or three connections and you really can be vulnerable and to really be yourself when you're communicating with these people, that is something that will help you even in the moments of stress, uh, in the moments of uh, different diseases you might have. Some things are unavoidable, but it will really um, help to keep your quality of life um, on a good side if you have friends and family that you can really connect to. So there is a large body of research that says that building connections is really great for us. If so, why building connections is so damn hard? And there is a variety of reasons for that. Um, these are just a few that one can name. I mean, obviously, there is a fear of rejection. If you don't know these people, you don't know what they're going to think about you. You become much more self-conscious, um, feeling of not fitting in, uh, feeling that you won't be able to bring your point across in a way you want to, to do. Uh, there are some cultural differences. At this conference, we have people from various countries. Obviously, each one of us have their own baggage, and it's sometimes very difficult to com communicate. Um, the social anxiety that um, most of us have on a certain level and whatnot. Um, but I would like to focus a bit more on the personality traits that are quite, may I say, stereotypical. Um, but it's something that I faced when I was working with academia, with researchers as well. It's, uh, I'm talking about being an introvert and extrovert and the difference between the two. So where these uh, terms actually came about, and the first uh, person who actually brought this term was Carl Jung in the beginning of 20th century. And he mentioned in one of his talks uh, a term introvert. And so he was talking about introverts, people who were focusing inwards of really um, enjoying being on their own and focusing um, on their sort of in inner world, so to say. And extroverts, people who were really focusing on other people, they were thriving when they were talking to other people and communicating uh, externally to, with, with groups of people. And they kind of draw their energy from those interactions. And uh, over the course of different um, studies, uh, they reached a conclusion that basically there is no person who is completely introverted and the person who is completely extroverted is basically a scale. And sometimes this scale also depends on different situations. So a person might be introverted in particular situations more, and in other situations they will be a bit more extroverted. Um, now let's talk about what actually it means in a sense of what happens on a molecular level when we are facing a conference like that, for example, like we have now, or even smaller conferences, or when we're going to meetings and stuff like that. So there's a lot of different um, hormonal changes that are happening inside of us at play. I'm going to talk about two. Uh, one is the dopamine. So you probably heard of dopamine. It's a feel-good chemical, and what it does is basically rewards us uh, when we engage in certain behaviors, and it encourages us to repeat them and to do them more and more. And building connections in general, it's a positive thing. So we should really, you know, um, get quite a lot of dopamine when we're communicating with other people. And then there's also adrenaline. So for our brain, it really doesn't make a huge difference whether it's a stress or excitement. Uh, we still would have adrenaline in our body. And what happen happens during a conference when you have a huge number of people and you um, try to communicate with all of them, these two, um, so dopamine is a neurotransmitter, it's not technically a hormone, but it's a hormone-like molecule, and adrenaline, these both really rise quite high up. And now, what happens is that we have dopamine receptors, and they are there to tell us whether we have enough dopamine in our body. So it's, it, the levels of dopamine go up, and then at some point we sort of feel, okay, we, we had enough. Now, why is this then difference between extroverts and introverts in the situation of building this connection? So it turns out that extroverts have more dopamine receptors than introverts do. And basically what it means is that 
uh, they need more dopamine to feel happy because they are less sensitive to it. So they really need to have those interactions more and more and more to reach that sort of level of saturation. Um, versus introverts, they getting this saturation much faster. And then once you reach that, your brain, say, brain says, okay, now I need to rewind. I had enough. And that can explain different situations that we have in our lives. Obviously, each one of us is a bit different, but this is kind of stereotypical picture that you might get. Um, now, we can't really change that. We are who we are. We have certain levels of receptors. There's something that you can't change. Uh, also, you still will need to face those situations when you do need to build connections, whether it's for work, for personal things, um, even connecting to people. If you're going to, if you're bringing your, your child to school, you need to connect to those people that you don't know. That's a bit always awkward as well. But how we overcome it? So there are different ways. I mean, I'm sure there are more than, than these, but these are the ones that I wanted to really highlight. And some of them really helped me for, as I said, like in Warsaw, I was super stressed with giving talks and so on. Um, I also did struggle connecting with people, but some of this really helped me out in the process. So first of all is listen. Uh, and when I'm saying listen, it's really listen. So not to try to prove that you're right, but rather listening to a person who's talking to you and try to understand their perspective before starting to speak. So sometimes it's kind of a bit intimidating for us to just to start to share our thoughts with, with a person. So you can ask a question, ask more questions. There are no silly questions. That's all I always say. And I think that you will be really surprised uh, how person that you're communicating with will be willing to share with you if you ask questions and if you listen. And then get out there and practice. So unfortunately, there is no magic pill that you can take and then you can conquer the world. But the more you do it, the less sort of sensitive you become to it. And you also develop your own techniques that work for you. Another thing is force your attention outwards. So normally as introverts, and I'm speaking for myself, you become very conscious about your yourself. So you're trying to scan your body, thinking about how am I standing? Am I smiling? Am I supposed to smile? Am I supposed to ask a question now? Did I say, did I use the right word? Oh, they use a different words for that. So maybe I should use the same word or maybe I will use mine. I feel a bit awkward. And then because you're constantly thinking of that, almost half of your brain is not even taking part in that conversation anymore. It's just scanning yourself and you're constantly trying to, to judge your own self, which you, that's not helpful at all. So instead try to focus your attention forcefully outwards to think about the person in front of you to think about what interests them why did they mention that term maybe it's important for them ask them a question and let them speak and just try to digest that information as it as it as it goes um, another thing is to focus on building strong one one-on-one -on -one relationships so when you have huge conferences like like this one, it might be a bit overwhelming, especially if you've been sent from work and they told you like you just go there and like you know communicate and and show your badge around so everyone can see your company and stuff like that. Um, so instead, try to focus on one on one connections. So if, if you meet a person and you want to talk to them, just talk to them. Focus on that. That's fine. There is no pressure for you to talk to eight hundred people. Honestly, I don't know a single person that I met and I spoke like within PostgreSQL community who can do that, even among very extroverted individuals. Um, have an exit strategy. So this is also something that might be helpful. Um, just have a plan for situations when you've been talking to a person for a while and you sort of feel that your dopamine already like way high up and you kind of miss the point, you're not listening to the person anymore, you just kind of feel, oh my God, I just need to step out. So first of all, don't drag it, this conversation until that point. Try ideally to scan yourself once in a while and feel that if it's getting too high, tell them, look, i really enjoying this conversation with you, but I have this work call that I have to attend. And can I just catch up with you later on? We're going to have the conference party tonight or there's other opportunities can can we do that later and then after that you can just go 
even go to the toilet, like sit in a cubicle, and meditate, breathe, go outside, go for a walk, just take a break from it. And basically communicate in those pockets of time. So make yourself, uh, give yourself pockets of time when you're communicating and pockets of time when you're resting. Obviously, since it's a conference, you have different talks to attend. So now you're just sitting and you're kind of relaxing. You're gonna, you know that then we're going to have lunch. So that's like a larger time span when you go out and you talk to people and, and, and eat. And I know that's a different challenge on its own, like eating pasta and trying to talk. Um, but once again, if you feel overwhelmed, step out and take a break. And, uh, I would like, I probably wouldn't be very wrong to say that majority of us are introverts. So we'll completely understand that. Um, another thing that I found super helpful, there was this talk by Amy Cuddy about power posing and as ridiculous as it sounded to me, at least when I first heard about it, it's really helpful. So the idea is that you know how sometimes they say if you hold a pencil and you do this, then you you automatically sort of feel a bit better and a bit more joyful and it um, and a bit more positive. So with power posing, it's kind of the same idea that you do certain power poses, like a sort of super Superman, Superwoman power posing before you need to go and network or give a talk or things like that. And that actually helps you to get that confidence. So it's not only working other way around when you're confident that really shows in your in your body. So people who are normally very um, sort of open and dominant, they 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 go in and they they sort of sit like this and they sort of try to take as much space as as possible, sort of alpha in alpha male kind of fashion. But it also work works other way around. So if you do those poses. And all you need is to do them on your own. You don't actually need an audience to do that. Uh, you just do it in the comfort of your room even. And then you go out. It actually gives you confidence afterwards. So that is really, I would really recommend watching that talk. And another point is when we have, I mean, we all have an agenda when we go to a conference like this. I mean, somebody is looking for a job. Somebody is um, have an idea for a patch that they want to pitch to somebody, et cetera, et cetera. And it always feels a bit awkward in a sense that we kind of going to be asking for favors and we need this from that person and this from other person. And it automatically puts us in a sort of weakest position. So I always recommend thinking about it in a way that you're sharing your gifts. So we're all different. Some of us have some, th some strong sides and, and all of us have less strong sides, but it is within that synergy that we have with other people where we can actually build something that we want to build. So we do need uh, con different connections to build something together and sort of fill each other's gaps, so to say. And another thing, I'm not gonna, I know it's, this is very wordy slide and I tend not to do it, but you will get this presentation, you'll be able to download it from the website and read a bit more in detail. But the idea is basically when you're going to a conference, you really can put for yourself a smart goal. So not to put a goal of, I'm going to network and going to meet the community, understand how it works and know everybody. Like that's not going to, it's not very achievable specific goal. So you set a goal saying, I don't know, I'm going to have meaningful conversation and build relationship with three people today. And you just limit at that. And everything else is a bonus. So once you've done these three people, if you have the energy to it, do four, do five, but at least you've done your minimum. And then the next day, if you feel that you want to raise the bar and just become a bit better at networking, five people and then see where it takes you. Now, um, moving back to PostgreSQL community, uh, there are different opportunities for connection um, that you can do. And I'm going to just briefly go through them. I know Stacy mentioned a few before during her uh, keynote. And also I would suggest, so this is, um, a link to my presentation that I done at this conference last year. And you don't actually need to watch the video. You can just go to the slides and slides have a lot of uh, links and information that you can read. Um, and there, there's a lot of information about different places where you can build those connections as well. But overall, so the, I would start from user groups. 
again, I think Stacy mentioned uh, before that those are very good base for building connections within your geographical area. So they can normally quite small. There's about 20, 25 people, unless there is a Chicago ones that are huge. <laughs> Thank you, Henrietta. Um, but normally they are quite cozy and sort of, um, and they, they meet uh, relatively regularly. I mean, Berlin has a, a relatively big one as well. I think it's about 200 people, if I'm not mistaken. And um, there are different things that you can do there. There's lots of different opportunities depending on your agenda and your goal and what you want to achieve. If you're looking for a job, if you're hiring, obviously there are people that they're there, they live somewhere nearby. You can build some connections with those people. If you're looking for a to, to solve a technical problem, once again, you can do it there. If you're, you want to practice giving a talk, you can, before you're coming to this conference or submitting your talk to this conference, if you feel a bit, that, you know, so you need to practice, you can go to user groups and give a talk there. Um, mentorship and so on. And basically just spend a Friday night with like-minded people. And by like-minded, I mean not necessarily postgres related like-minded so keeping in mind that those people live in your area physically they have kids who might go to the same school that your kids go to they might like cycling and they cycle on the same path that you go to there is actually a high chance that you already met those people in supermarkets in other areas in just a normal life that we have outside of postgres but you didn't realize that they're part of postgres community so just keep an open mind and see where it takes you. And if you want to see the list of different user groups, you can go to the website and they list it there. Um, some of them are listed also on the meetup.com. Uh, I would also in general suggest just Googling and see what Google tells you because there's high chance that, well, not high chance, but there is a chance that there are some groups that we don't know about and they are neither of those places. Um, Moving on to conferences, PG days, uh, PGU conferences like this one, conferences in the States where you have large audiences, is basically they have the same benefits that you would get um, with user groups, but we're talking about larger audiences. So obviously uh, meeting somebody whose kids go to the same school, the chances are sort of lower. However, um, if you want to meet somebody within the community, if you want to talk to different hackers, et cetera, this is the place because you have many speakers who come from different geographies and they, they come to this conference, you can really meet them face to face and have those conversations. Um, if you want to grow professionally, if you want to talk to people who organize their own meetups, who people who actually organize bigger conferences and to learn from them if you have an idea of organizing your own, um, this is the place for you to do so as well. And you can also go to the website uh, and see all different uh, community conferences out there. <clears throat> Oops. Uh, and the next thing is mailing lists. So mailing lists is kind of a key means of communication within the community. One of the reasons that there are archives of all the mailing lists, interactions and communication that happening on, on the mailing lists and you can read through those archives. You can subscribe to mailing lists. You can unsubscribe from them once you sort of maybe fed up with all the information that you keep getting. Um, they are they have different topics, so it's really depending on what you're trying to achieve. There are different mailing lists for different purposes. Um, and in general, I think mailing lists they're a very good base for you to learn how people communicate within the community. Um, Hackers mailing list is a very specific mailing list that probably deserve separate type of attention. Um, and there are different, I'm not gonna like overwhelm this information about that one because there are a lot of different separate talks talking just about hackers mailing lists. Um, there was a recent, very recent thread um, that you can access if you scan that QR code. And um, that was about the language that has been used on, on hackers mailing lists. And there was also a panel discussion at PGCon Dev that I think is really worth um, listening to with different opinions about how people feel when they try to get into hacking and things like that. But overall, if you 
want to take an active part, active role in hacking or in other, in other activities, I find that subscribing to mailing lists and once again, just listening to how people communicate, what language they use, how they position their requests, what kind of answers they get. If you want to contribute to that, that's really helpful. So you don't actually necessarily need, there, it's not a must to contribute to the mailing list once you subscribe, but it can be very beneficial and informative. Another thing is social media. Now, social media is not for everyone. I'm not saying that everyone needs to go and subscribe to everything and have accounts uh, on different platforms. However, it's important to know that some people that you possibly want to connect with, they will be on social media. So it's before you, if you want to connect to somebody, let's say, if you have an idea for a patch, for example, and you come into this conference, you, want, you know that you want to talk to that particular person. Um, and just to get their understanding, like whether your ideas is worthy of, of pushing through and to make that connection. But you don't know that person. You feel a bit intimidated talking to them straight away. It might worthwhile seeing whether they are on social media or not, reading their posts, maybe commenting on their posts, maybe liking their posts, maybe reposting their posts. And then slowly but surely, you will get a feeling that you kind of already know the person and the person might know you as well because they've seen that you like their post, that you reposted their post, they, 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 remember, they might remember your comment as well. And when you're meeting them here, you already have a ready icebreaker to talk to them and say like, oh, that was a really cool idea that you, you wrote the other day and I read that and I have this and this sort of um, ideas around that. So it's, again, something uh, that you do across all those different platforms. So just look at all of them at once. So if you go to a user group meeting, you're meeting somebody there, then you can connect to them via LinkedIn. You can connect them via LinkedIn and maybe they can connect you to somebody else who you want to talk to. And then when you come to a conference like this, once again, you can do some pre-conference research and then connect to that person. And then listen and listen and learn. Another opportunity to connect is being a part of different committees, or sitting on boards. I mean, for, to, for being on boards of PGS or uh, Postgres Europe, you obviously need to go through elections. Uh, and I think to do that, you do need to have some base of connections within the community. Um, but for being on committees and, for example, being an organizer of event like this, I find it's really beneficial for building strong connections because you're really tightly sort of bound to other people who are organizing it. You have similar pains, you have a lot of things to discuss and so on. So it's really um, very sort of fruitful interaction um, to have. So just in general, to, to sum up until here, um, what would be your reasons for connecting is to grow professionally, grow personally, to understand the product that you're using in a community, and just keep in mind that the stronger connections within the community we have, this will ensure that Postgres is here to stay. And a um, few tips to remember. Um, I've listed them here. I'm probably not going to repeat all of them, but in general, offline dynamics boosts online dynamics and vice versa. And you listen, you learn the lingo, and then you take part in those conversations. And as I said, make a conscious decision to listen to person and not talking to them to prove that you're right, which I know a lot of us do that automatically, but we have kind of have to step out of it and try to understand the perspective of the person that we're talking to. And yes, when you feel overwhelmed, just take a break, breathe. It's absolutely fine. There is no pressure. We have whole three days. This is why this conference is actually quite great compared to, to shorter conferences that you know that if today you really don't feel like it, you still have tomorrow. And we are here with the same goal to keep Postgres, what to make Postgres better. And with regards to building all those different connections and what they might lead to, if you, this is another thing that you can use during your conversations. And if you have like no, um, particular topic you want to talk to another person, just ask them what they, how long they've been in the community, uh, what they've done and how they've done it through, like what sort of connections led them to do it. I had uh, several conversations with different people before this talk. Um, I'm not gonna go through all the different stories, but 
I really enjoyed having those conversations when I asked them, okay, did you have a particular patch that you worked on and, and you had a particular connection with another person that helped you to do it? And there was a lot of stories of, okay, somebody has an idea and then they meet somebody else at an absolutely random place, maybe conference party, or they just went for a walk and then met the person and then they went to another person's website and another person heard them talking and then he built a prototype and so on and so forth. And this is how things like wait events, alt table, foreign data wrap are coming about, some people finding jobs, some people find connections, some people meeting people that then become their really good friends which I must say probably the most valuable thing of all. Uh, but uh, then you have different user groups that are being born out of those interactions. Um, some people find inspiration, some people um, finding job for somebody else, or if you're, you're being interviewed for a job, you can talk to people who actually work in that community and, and connect to them. Even this conference, I was talking to Andreas uh, Sherbao and Magnus, and I asked them, like, how did you actually came about this idea of doing this PGCon for you thing? And apparently, um, they met at FOSDEM because at FOSDEM, Andreas, he was booting the Postgres booth on his own, and then he met Dave and Magnus, and they had a chat, and they thought, oh, that would be a nice idea to have a user group. So this conference started as a user group many years ago. And this is where we are now. We have almost 800 people attending, which is amazing. So when building a connection, um, what does actually building connection mean? It's understand that there is a relationship between two or more things or people in this case. And I will try to prove the fact that you actually have much more in common between yourselves than you think. So... This is the project, I don't know if you heard about um, Person of the Week project of Andreas. He's been doing it for a few years now. He's been interviewing different people within the community, asking them questions um, about their background, uh, about their life, hobbies, and things like that. And he has done a talk. Um, there is a video that you can watch, but it's a, and there are slides on his blog as well. Um, what I learned in interviewing PostgreSQL community, and there are some nice statistics about things that Postgres community is interested in or community is doing. Um, so let's see. So what was the first PostgreSQL version that you used? Um, how about 8.2? Can we have a show of hands? Okay. How about 9.6? 7.2? Okay, so as you can see here, this is some stuff from an Andreas' uh, talk, and you probably have quite a lot in common with people who started roughly at the same time working with Postgres as you did. Um, they're probably similar to you age-wise, but they also have different stories to tell about those times. So it's automatically give you an idea of what sort of topics you can discuss with them. Now, what about some activities you activities that you enjoy doing? How about reading? Anybody enjoy reading? How about movies? So that's quite relates to to this slide. How about cycling and hiking? So that's pretty cool. So you have a nice company there with with quite a few um, people who enjoy the same activities. Now, i leave you with another quote, just to end this and to give you some inspiration, I hope. A great dread fell on him as he was awaiting the pronouncement of some doom that he had long foreseen and vainly hoped might after all never be spoken. An overwhelming longing to rest and remain at peace by Bilbo's side in Rivendell filled his heart. At last, with an effort, he spoke and wondered to hear his own words as if some other will was using his small voice. I will take the ring, he said, though I don't know the way. So I hope that this talk, is, if anything, gives you these three messages that I want to really bring. First, you have always something in common with people around you. Second, and I know that the numbering is a bit weird there, uh, shift your focus to connection and you might get much more than just an answer to your question that you have. 
And third, today across all of the Greece and may I say probably all of the Europe, you won't find another location with such high concentration of people who share your interests. And I want to thank all the people that helped me to build this presentation. And I also, I don't know if you follow me on LinkedIn or not, but I posted a post saying you will understand why I brought these to the conference. I have them back with me. So I have some of those pins. I hope you find them funny somewhat. And I thought people who are going to have meaningful conversations with me, they're going to get one. So there you go. Thank you. Questions? Valeria, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, and you know, you are amazing. I'm so happy you are in charge of uh, Postgres user groups. Uh, and uh, my question is for user groups, what's the most challenging part of your job? You've already been there for like over a year, right? or just a year, right? A year. Like, uh, you mean being being a chair of you, you, yeah, you, user, yeah you, user groups yeah 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 most challenging one um i think it's and this is something that we need to do probably more so i have a feeling that um there is a misconception that people need some sort of approval to run user groups um that's absolutely not true. You don't need to get approval from anyone. You can just go and run it. Um, and I think partially sometimes we get questions and requests and it really makes me think that people think, okay, I need to be on the committee to organize a user group. I need to be super connected to other people. To this is actually not true. So to organize a user group, all you need is a brain <laughs> and a will to build connection, to connect people with each other. So everything else can be managed. If you need a speaker, we have Speakers Bureau, we have Bruce out there, you can approach him, he can probably come to you. <laughs> uh, if you need a space where you want to run a user group, there's also, once again, there are different options to, to find different even free locations. You can go to the pub, you can go to public library, you can, um, ask a company that you work at maybe to sponsor a room, you can find a room, that's not a problem as well. Food, same thing. Inviting people, we as a committee can help you to navigate places where you can post and announce, make announcements and attract people. So I think there is, there is that, that's one of the challenges I would say. So I would really love to hear more, like not requests from people asking whether I can organize user group, but rather hearing from people saying, Oh, I have user group, but I have this particular challenge for next event, and then we can actually help them. And we can get, yeah, they can get some support as well from PGUS. So if they need financially some help, we can do that as well. It can be arranged. You, you you can always find me right across the hall <laughs> with with these. It's not a great in this comment. Uh, so um, if you were following Valeria's presentation, never do users group on Friday night. Never. It's not going to work. <laughs> Uh, the Berlin user group is a little bit bigger than the 200 people you mentioned. I just looked it up. It's 1,604. Oh, wow. Okay. And the biggest one we had was nearly about 300 people uh, while well, I was the second one to give a talk. Mm -hmm. And the bad thing for me was uh, I had to give it after Josh Burgess. <laughs> but but the good thing was there came a question which I couldn't answer and I just asked Josh can you please help me perfect there you go that's what I was talking about that you need like we have we're all different we have different areas that we know really well so unless we work together there's no way we're going to tackle some things so there Okay, uh, thanks for your talk. It was quite inspiring for me. Uh, one of your slides, you were talking about uh, the communities and the 
the mailing lists mm -hmm. and the aspects of being humble and welcoming, mm -hmm. which is not always true on tech and communities. We can take the Linux community, which uh, if we talk about Linux himself, he was a pain in the ass, I would say. Uh, yeah, an asshole, <laughs> actually. And do you have some, actually, you talked about the persons that want to get inside the communities. You have a lot of tips for that. Mm -hmm. Do you have some more tips for the people that are welcoming people in the communities, you know, accepting new people? Some some tips for accepting diversities on the communities. So I think just the realization that people are different and um, people are very, especially when they're new to, to, to any community, like even when we're talking about just a regular life, um, they feel much more self-conscious than people who are already in. So once you're in, you can kind of relax and be yourself. And once, when you're still sort of looking from outside, you feel a bit intimidating. So every single comment that you give to those people is going to be magnified 10 times at least. So keeping that in mind. And then basically, I think it's a process. I mean, hackers mailing lists have an issue with that as well. And they've been talking, so in, in that panel that I uh, linked to in, in the presentation, but you probably heard about the panel that they've done at the Dev conference. They've been talking about those, uh, I mean, they've been talking about cultural differences as well, but also the language that they use and that the comments can be a bit harsh, but sometimes you need harsh comments because you need to tell people actually what you think to make them move forward and so on. But I think it's a process. I mean, as a community in general, we're getting much more aware of it and that's a huge step forward. Um, and I think, yeah, I mean, it, it's just a matter of practice for people who are trying to join and, and for us, who people who try to welcome them as well. It's, it's just that sort of two-way interaction. Like in a way, it, once again, we need to listen to those people. Just listen what they say and, and try to get into their shoes as well, because maybe they don't know how to position themselves. And I mean, there's always an option if you saw somebody communicating online and then you had some comments, maybe it's worth it. If you meet them at the conference, it might be better to communicate to them face to face. As difficult as it sounds, it's actually better. I mean, we are not, we are humans. We're not meant to be communicating online as a whole. I mean, it's better to see how people, how a person feels, their body language. It just feels completely different. Any other questions? Oh, Stacy. Thank you, Valeria. That was great. My question would be, what do you wish you had known when you first joined the community that you know now? Mm, that's a good one. Um, I think I probably wish I knew um, how great people are. Um, I think at the beginning when you haven't met many people still, you have those sort of misconceptions and once again because majority of us are introverts sometimes you might misread people as being a bit cold um, but now when I've, I've been like working and communicating with those people for a few years this is absolutely not true I mean obviously we're all different we have our different things and we quite, have quite strong opinions about things but it doesn't mean that we are unwelcoming and, and cold so I think I just wished I think it would just sped, sped up the connections that I've made. Thank you. Thank you. I think no more questions. Everybody's hungry. That will finish the talk then. Thank you very much, Valeria. Thank you.